Senhoras e senhores, a Fundação Getúlio Vargas tem a satisfação de recebê-los para mais um evento. Sejam bem-vindos ao auditório do Centro Cultural FGV. Nosso auditório possui rede Wi-Fi, nome e senha da rede, exibidos nos prismas localizados na recepção ou nos telões após este vídeo. Solicitamos que não sejam consumidos alimentos e bebidas no interior do auditório. Solicitamos ainda que os telefones celulares sejam mantidos no modo silencioso e com flashes desativados. Para maior conforto e segurança, fiquem atentos aos procedimentos a serem seguidos em caso de emergência. Nosso auditório está estruturado com três saídas de emergência, todas identificadas com placas de orientação e equipadas com barras antipânico. De frente para o palco, temos duas saídas, uma no lado esquerdo e outra no lado direito. Uma terceira saída de emergência está localizada na parte superior ao fundo do auditório. Os extintores de incêndio estão localizados nas laterais do palco e ao fundo do auditório, um em cada lado, e estão sinalizados conforme as normas internacionais de segurança. Em caso de incêndio, os detectores de fumaça localizados no teto acionam o sistema de alarme e nossa brigada de incêndio, devidamente treinada, entra em ação. Em caso de queda de energia, o grupo gerador será acionado. Vale lembrar que em caso de emergência, os elevadores não devem ser utilizados. E para maior segurança, nosso auditório é monitorado com câmeras de segurança 24 horas. A Fundação Getúlio Vargas, desde já, agradece a presença de todos em nosso Centro Cultural e deseja a todos os presentes um ótimo evento. So, good afternoon. It is a, gr a great pleasure to welcome the participants and each of you here for the discussion uh, panel, O Vento Mudou de Direção, How Digital Media Impact the Coverage of Conflicts. I also welcome those who are, who are uh, with us in the, in the streaming, online streaming. Before I begin, let me tell you a little FGV disclaimer. All statements expressed by Fundação Getúlio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasts ex exclusively represent their opinions and not necessarily FGV institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone present here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will and they consented to be recorded, recorded in this broadcast, which will be posted later on FGV's official channels. We consider today's discussion fundamental uh, because the digital media and consumption of information have change, changed the dynamics of the communications in general. The coverage that was made for the attack on the 9-11 and that uh, went immediately on television today would have been even greater debate on social networks. Conflict coverage, war journalism, and international politics have adapted to the speed of information by bringing even more real-time content to society. Here, we'll discuss how this coverage has changed, what challenges digital communication has presented to, conf to conflict journalism, and how information from independent and local personal journalists has greater power to spread these days, and can even alter the agenda of the so-called mainstream media. To form this discussion, we are honored to welcome the journalist Bakr Atiani, who interviewed Osama Bin Laden two months before the attack on the Twin Towers on September 11, in 2001. Uh, Simone Duarte, Duarte, journalist who covered the attack for TV Globo and is the author of the book O Vento Mudou de Direção, o 11 de setembro que o mundo não viu. And to, and to make the mediation, Marcelo Lins, uh, presenter and commentator of Global News, 
and author of the book Um Longe Perto, Histórias de um Jornalista Nesse Mundo que Dá Voltas. Uh, so uh, I, I thank you all of you again, and please, Marcelo, it's a pleasure for us to receive all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Har. Thank you for all of you to be here, and it's very well timed our uh, event here because we were just waiting for Simone's mother to arrive, and she just arrived, and because we couldn't start even more so that uh, today is the International Women's Day, so I also have to take this opportunity to not to to say congratulations to you, but as a colleague of mine said uh, earlier on, to say força na luta for all the women and girls here and all over, because the, the fight is just beginning. First of all, it's a great pleasure because I should be there with you, not here, so I'm privileged to be among these two people here and to be able to make some questions. But of course, we'll be able as well uh, later on when we open for the, the questions for the audience. And uh, starting from my right-hand side here, I have uh, an old colleague of mine because we work for the same, uh, she worked for the same uh, media group as I still work, even if it was in the parallel words, because she always worked for more than 15 years at TV Globo, and I work for more than 20 years now, more than 25 years now for Globo News, so I'm the first generation uh, of uh, pay TV and news channel here in Brazil. And Simone, originally from Rio, she is, has a long career in journalism and uh, specializing in international news, and uh, she also has got a, her master in uh, news school in New York, and her work had led her to travel all around the world. She was chief of uh, TV Global Bureau in New York at the time of uh, the 9-11. She also was in London for a while working for Global. She's been in Portugal for uh, 15 years right now. She worked there in the transformation, the digital transformation of Publico, which is the main Portuguese newspaper. So she's got a lot to do uh, and a lot to say to us about what does it mean taking a newspaper from uh, the paper era, physical paper, to the digital world. And uh, of course, she's also a documentarist. Uh, she's realized the documentary on uh, Serge Vieira de Mello, wrote Baghdad. And uh, of course, the author of this great book, which I don't know why uh, hasn't been turned in uh, a TV series so far, but uh, yes, yeah, soon to be a TV series as well, I'm sure, with great success. And uh, before I let you start speaking, I'm just going to do the same very short introduction with Bakker here, or Becker Atiani, very difficult to pronounce, and uh, he even apparently isn't sure which is the best way to, to say it, whether it's Bakker or Becker. I'm going with Becker because you said Becker just five minutes ago. Uh, Jordanian from Palestinian descent, journalist specialized in uh, radical Muslim groups in Asia, working for uh, Arab News uh, before that, and also Al Arabiya, and he also supervised the transition uh, to digital world, let's say, of a TV channel, which is quite different from what happened with Publico, but we can also gather these experiences and learn from them. Uh, Bakker was the man who interviewed uh, Osama bin Laden, yes, two months before the attacks of 9-11, and I want to know from him also in uh, some minutes why you and uh, what you got from that experience. After all, as we're talking about conflict, journalism, and uh, even if we live in a country that's so-called a peaceful country, we know very much, and journalists and anybody that studies Brazil knows that uh, this is very much a country with lots of conflict situation, either in the big cities like Rio or Sao Paulo, or if you go to the Amazon rainforest, all the problems are very similar that we face as journalists when we try to cover uh, urban violence or violence in the forest or uh, against the Indian population and so forth and so on. So Bakker knows very much in the deep what does it mean to be a conflict journalist. He has been in 2012 kidnapped by the Abu Sayyaf terrorist group in the Philippines 
and he was captive for one and a half year. And of course, I'm going to ask him about this experience and what uh, he learned about that. How did it change your way to see things and your way you approach life as well? Back to Simone. Uh, I'd like to start going back 20 years or so ago to ask you where you were exactly on the 9-11, because I know that you took part in that coverage, and what sort of uh, technical tools did you have at hand to help you to cover what happened in 9-11? Well, thank you, good afternoon everybody, thank you for being here at three o'clock. Um, um, at that time there was no smartphones, no social media, and in fact, when the, the buildings started to be attacked, uh, the cell phone uh, network and even the, uh, the, the dishes that transmit global signal to Brazil, they were in the building. So basically, we stay with uh, very limited access to technology. To, so it took like three or four hours. In fact, it took like five hours to be able to transmit something with someone live to Jornal Hoje, for example. But on that day, I arrived early on at the newsroom because I didn't have anything to sell to the Jornal Nacional. So basically, I have no news. And I arrived, there was a librarian with me, and then we, we I don't, I, at that time, the newsrooms, you have uh, several TV sets, and we have Associated Press and Reuters pictures, and we're starting to see the picture of a plane inside one of the buildings of the World Trade Center. And, and then we thought it was like a small jet because it had happened before with the World Trade Center, but then there was the second plane. And then we thought, well, two jets, two small jets at the same, not, not possible. And, and then they asked me to go, uh, people in Brazil asked me to go live because we, we were having difficulties to get reporters, I mean, to call reporters. So basically I have one hand uh, on a phone, an ordinary phone, talking to Brazil live on air with Carlos Nascimento. And on the other hand, I tried to get everybody to go to work and to start working. Um, there are three moments that for me are very strong and uh, I kept in my memory, which was the first moment was the Pentagon being attacked because when the Pentagon was attacked, I really said to myself, I said a bad word to myself, but it doesn't matter now. And I thought, well, that's not an amateur. That's serious. That's the third war. I thought of a third war. That's something. The second moment was when the, the first building collapsed. The first building that collapsed was, the, in fact, uh, the second building to be attacked. It was not the first one to be attacked. And so when the first building collapsed, then I remember because my voice changed, you know, and I said to Carlos Nassman, ah, the building collapsed. And uh, apparently it was the only moment that I was like completely know, it's astonished. And the third moment was when we started to see people falling, jumping from the buildings. And that's very interesting because, and then coming back to digital, because at that time, uh, in the US, people, I mean, the, the TV's network, they didn't show that picture, or those pictures, because many people started to jump. Um, so in the United States, for many years, the Americas didn't see people jumping from the World Trade Center. But we did, we and other TVs around the world. And uh, when I wrote the book, there was a journalist who asked me, you didn't feel, uh, you know, uh, that was not, um, it was ethical, not, uh, not at clear. And what would have happened today? Today, we would have 10,000 images of cell phones filming everything, memes, in five minutes. So that's what changed from mm -hmm. 20 years ago. Did I answer everything? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, of course we're gonna go back yeah, to that, yeah, but yeah, as a yeah. start, yeah. it's okay. For yeah? him, he's the star. <laughs> Becker, that's basically the same question. Where were you and what did you do? But also for you, of course, I'll have to add something, is that if the moment you heard the news about what was happening in New York, did it come to your mind what had happened some months earlier when you were in the mountains of Afghanistan? interviewing, talking, having lunch with Osama bin Laden and uh, his associates there. And uh, then I'd like you to uh, tell us a bit, when you went to the mountains, what did you bring with you? 
to register what would happen there in that interview. So these two moments. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for uh, giving. I think it's on. I think it's on. It is on. Yeah, you can hear me all. I guess. So I just want to thank you first uh, for giving me this opportunity, and it's a great pleasure uh, to share with you my experience. I'll try throughout this uh, discussion to focus on two things, the professional level and also the personal experience, which I think it's, it's good to, to share. Uh, so uh, the interview with Bin Laden, uh, I interviewed him in June 2001. Uh, I think the news that the takeaway from that interview was this information in the coming weeks um, there will be a big surprise American and Israeli interests will be targeted then he goes on and he said that the coffin business will increase in the US so these were the two main um, I would say takeaways or messages uh, were in uh, Bin Laden's uh, interview uh, certainly back then uh, there were no, uh, as uh, Simon said, we were having only the analog uh, uh, cell phones, uh, no digital cameras, nothing. Uh, if we want to talk about that transformation, I think the militant groups were able to uh, benefit from this uh, transformation from the uh, traditional uh, media, um, mediums of, of communication into the latest. I will just give a, l uh, a little example. When I interviewed Bin Laden, um, I was surprised that he was having with, uh, he was filming because I was not allowed to bring my camera with me, and my, not my cameraman. So he was, his cameraman, he was having a digital camera, a DV cam. Back then in 2001, DV cam was almost something, not everyone has. I work with one of the biggest, back then, biggest TV stations in, in the Middle East. And we used to uh, we used to use uh, the beta cam. If, mm -hmm. if some of you are familiar, we were using beta cam cameras, and uh, those cameras were also uh, analog, not digital. Bin Laden was having actually a digital camera back then in 2001. When I when I took the tape because it was their tape, and I returned back to my base, which was back then Islamabad, the capital of Pakistan, it was for me difficult actually to play the video because there were no, uh, no um, players for this uh, type of, uh, the latest uh, uh, kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, videos uh, uh, format. Later we found a camera and through the camera we were able to transfer it into um, analog and, and then uh, I was able to play the, uh, the, whole, the whole thing. Um, no doubt it f for me as, as a journalist, uh, everyone is, uh, this question has been asked several times, why Bin Laden has chosen you for this interview? Um, I think uh, I, I, uh, I have no, um, not for me to answer on his behalf, but as a journalist, as a professional, I, I got an opportunity to interview the most wanted person in the world. I don't think I should uh, turn it down. I don't know if there are journalists here on the floor, and I, I'm sure they will go for it as well. So um, from uh, my professional perspective, for me it was important. My editor approved it. I went for it. But if I want to try to say maybe why, I would say because back then I used to work with one of the biggest TV stations in the Middle East. I was based in a country that is very near to Afghanistan. He wanted to talk to the media and the, he wanted actually to send across this message, something is going to happen in the coming weeks. So maybe because of uh, these reasons, uh, he has actually uh, chosen, chosen me, I was based there, so has, r rather I would say has chosen my TV station than he has chosen me. But till today, for the past 20 years, I'm, I'm still like, you know, uh, may talking about uh, this interview. May yeah. I just ask or add something? The fact that you're a Palestinian yes. helped. Well, um, so I don't know, as, as, again, as I said, maybe, yes, if I want to start thinking maybe, maybe it could be one of the reasons because he actually added Israel in, in the threat. Of course, it was just for the public consumption. It was for gaining sympathy and support because this, he, he thought maybe this could bring kind of uh, a sympathy, a support to, to his uh, kind of uh, cause. thing i just want to read uh, is, is because it's become our gig 
I just want to read a paragraph, which is the moment that Bakar enter in the room and Osama is there. So it's going to be in Portuguese, and he knows Portuguese now, so I had been reading this for him for a while. So no, uh, no English translation? Huh? No English translation. No English translation, okay. No, I, I know it. Oh, he knows it. So, lá no meio da sala, à minha espera, estava um homem muito alto, vestido com a túnica árabe, um turbante branco na cabeça e uma K-74 tiracolo. Osama Bin Laden me abraça e cumprimenta calorosamente. Da, da boas-vindas junto a dois egípcios. Só um momento, eu adoro essa parte que ele abraça calorosamente. Tá? Esse é um cara que abraçou, quer dizer, que foi abraçado calorosamente pelo Osama. É, da boas-vindas junto a dois egípcios, ao Zawari, o, o número 2 da Al-Qaeda, e Mohamed Atef, que havia tomado café da manhã comigo. Além deles estão Abu Hafs al-Maritani, o único que seria contra os atentados de 11 de setembro, e outros dois homens que não sei quem são, mas que formam o comitê executivo da Al-Qaeda. Lá estava eu, no meio dos homens mais procurados do mundo. Por que eu fui o escolhido? Por que me chamaram? A possibilidade de ser atingido por um míssil teleguiado passou pela minha cabeça. Yeah. You want to say anything about that hug the hug, and the yeah. impression that uh, that man uh, you had about that man this first encounter when you met him? As Bin Laden, yeah? Yeah. Well, I was hugged by the most wanted person in the world, yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, of course, the trip to Bin Laden took uh, more than two days uh, because I need to travel from the Pakistani capital to the borders of Afghanistan. His men to smuggle me. They have smuggled me inside Afghanistan. And then I have to stay at some place for a night, overnight, in order to arrange the interview. Then his security, Bin Laden's team, security team, because they have a security team for the group, and they're the special unit that deals with him himself. So they, they transported me, carried me to, to his hideout or with a place he has chosen for the interview. They did another uh, security check. I was allowed to enter a room. Then I saw a tall guy. He is very tall, Bin Laden. So he immediately hugged me, welcome, whatever. And the other uh, uh, leaders of Al-Qaeda, there were uh, five in the room. I was able to um, recognize three of them, in fact, four. Uh, the military leader of the group, uh, he's an Egyptian, his name is Muhammad Atif, or known as Abu Hafs. He was killed in November 2001 during the U.S. Uh, uh, bombardment in, uh, around Kabul. Ayman Zawahiri, who, who later became the leader of the Al-Qaeda, who was killed just recently in Kabul. And another uh, one of their, uh, you, you could see that their, um, they, they have a council, for the group, so the head of that council, which, which like take the decisions. It's kind of the parliament, if you'd say, the, uh, the, he was head of that uh, council of the group. He is f uh, he's from Mauritania, and this guy was against the attacks, by the way. And he opposed Bin Laden, and later he left Al-Qaeda. And he's, till today, he, uh, he, uh, he lives right now in, uh, in, in his country, in, in Mauritania, this guy. Um, so, uh, The impression, first of all, I, I could see Bin Laden, a uh, person who doesn't talk much. He just gives a message and he wants to listen more than to uh, ask, to, to engage with you. He just listen, he, he wants to hear from you. Secondly, he goes very personal with you. He will try to ask you about your life, family, your work. So he gets very close. He, he wants to get uh, very close to you. It's, it was very clear that he has this charisma of a leader among his followers. They were like respecting him much. Uh, during uh, that meeting, which went for like three hours, he went out. I think he went for prayers uh, with, other, uh, with the, the other leaders of the group. And I was alone in the room with another guy who was armed, a young guy, maybe 18 or 19 years old. So the guy told me, so the Americans want five million dollars on his head? I said, yes, this is what, what I know. He said, you can tell them that whatever they will do, they won't be able to catch him. We are here to protect him. That was the kid, the young, uh, the young guy who was uh, part of his special unit, Bin Laden's special unit. So he was this, has this charisma, this presence as a, as a strong leader, as a, a leader who actually has this uh, control over his uh, over his men
Yeah, so this is quickly <laughs> what I... Uh, you you yeah. just gave me the cue to go back to Simone here, because as you read, uh, Becca is in your book, is one of uh, seven characters that are uh, sort of profiled in your book. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, is a book that if uh, anyone of you hasn't read yet, it's on sale outside, but not only that, it's very interesting because when you read it, it's very, it, it's two impressions that you got at uh, first hand. First one is that uh, how th this point of views that are uh, in the book are different from those that we've been used to see in our coverage in the Brazilian media and in Western media in general, which is very much uh, Western-oriented uh, coverage. There you have people from other parts of the world that have been affected, of course, like the whole world by what happened in 9-11, but they give their point of view. And I want to, and so you have Pakistani, you have people uh, in Afghanistan as well, you have uh, a Jordanian-Palestinian uh, man, and so far and so on. And I'd like to know, how did you manage to find these characters? Why did you choose these people? And if your background in TV as we're talking about uh, intersection of media and the way we can use uh, uh, journalistic content in different ways. Your background in TV helped you to write the book the way you wrote it, like uh, very fragmented, uh, the stories that aren't, uh, you, you don't follow one whole story and then another one is they are all mixed. So first, I, I want to say that I, I during 18 years, I didn't uh, hear my voice or listen to my voice on that day. So 18 years after that, uh, I decided to listen to that day. Mm -hmm. uh, the recordings of what yeah. you said. And then I realized that I didn't want to, because everybody always uh, you know, asks, me, asks me, oh, write a book or s tell those stories that you are telling everybody. And you know, I didn't want to talk about the firemen. I didn't want to talk about the people who had died. I didn't want to talk about uh, Osama and the espionage game because all that was covered by the Americans, the British, everybody in the West. And I was looking for what's the story that I want to talk about. A and then I realized that the, w the story that needs to be talked about is the, is the people who are not in that building, the people who are not Americans. In fact, the people who are in the countries most affected by the answer the government of the United States gave after 9-11, which is, was the war on terror. And who are those people and where are those people? It's, it's Iraq, it's Afghanistan, and it's Pakistan. Mm. Funny enough, Simon, just interrupting you and saying sorry for that, uh, you must remember that uh, the terrorists that took part in the attacks were mainly from Saudi. Egypt and Saudis. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. 16 Not were Saudis. Yes, yeah. 16 were Saudi. Yeah. 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 16, 16, 16, out of were yeah. 16 out of 19 were Saudis, but yeah. the countries that the U.S. chose to launch his war on terror uh, were yeah. those that you... And it's important just to add that Iraq has nothing to do with 9-11. And talking about media, in 2003, so 2003, 70% of Americans in the eve of the occupation of the United States to Iraq, 70% thought that Saddam Hussein has something to do with 9-11, which is well, talking about media, because this is a construction of media, okay? So, so then I decided that I wanted to talk to people and, uh, that are from those countries, but I didn't want to talk to Malala. I didn't want to talk to people who are very famous, or everybody knows. I want to talk to people who could be uh, your sister, your brother, your mother, your girlfriend, normal people like us, like middle class. Um, so, because I'm a journalist and I know lots of people around the world, I started to, to do my job, you know. And uh, so, just briefly talking, and, and I'm going to talk about Becker because Becker was not supposed to be in this book. Uh, but I tell in th three minutes, two minutes. So, just to finalize, so who are they? Uh, in Pakistan, it was uh, a boy who was 13. Uh, he was trained by the Taliban, by Pakistani Taliban, because there, are, there is the Pakistani Taliban and the African Taliban, which is a little bit different, but it's the same. Uh, yeah, let's say, like, <laughs> summarizing like this. So he was trained by the Pakistani Taliban. He entered on a mo in a mosque, 
to kill people. I mean, he has his, uh, the, explo the explosive in the belt, and he saw people praying. He, ha he had been having mixed feelings, and he decided not to blow himself. And then he went to a process of deradical, de I, I hate this word, disradicalization and rehabilitation. And now he's 23. When I interviewed he, him, he was 23. I interviewed other two uh, boys who were 13 at the time, and now they are 25 or something. And they now study philosophy, and they went social science. And there was a, a, a great program. But can you imagine, at 13, you, start, you decided to blow up yourself, and then you gave up, and then you have to go back to your life, and which life is that? So this is one character. The other character was the general, who was the equivalent of the head of the CIA of Pakistan on, at the time that uh, Osama bin Laden has to be caught. So, so those two were on opposite sides. Then I have two women from Iraq, one who is living now in, in the US, who hates to live in the US, and the other one who flew from Iraq to Syria, then there was another war, her dream is to live in the US, so the dream of one of them is the nightmare of the other one. And, and finally, the Pakistani, the, the Afghans, both live in Vienna, they don't know each other. One, you're going to follow his escape from the Taliban, and the other one, you're going to follow her escape from the occupation, the US occupation. And then there is Becker. So I was in Pakistan, okay, it's a little bit strange because I was in Pakistan to do a course with the military <laughs> of the security and leadership, and Becker was too. And it was the first course, the, it was a workshop for foreigners. So it was 2019, March 2019. And you know how those workshops and congress that you go and then you have to wait on a bus to go to a dinner, and this guy entered and we were there, and there in front of us there was like uh, uh, a truck full of military, like, with heavy guns, guns, like heavy guns. And I look at him, he, he, you sat in front of me. And he looked at me, smiling like he does, and, uh, and he said, and I said, is this necessary, it's not too much? And he said, well, yeah, I think so too, but you know, there, there was a, a point in time that that was necessary when I lived here. And I said, okay, blah, 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 and he said, I'm a journalist. I said, oh, that's so good, nice, because I, I went to interview Hamid Mir. And then I, I needed to do a break because I had had in I had had in December. This was March in December of 2018. I had a dinner with Marcos Oshow and Teresa Oshow who were there, and I didn't want to go to Pakistan. Okay, and and I, I wanted to write a book. And then I said to Mark, Why don't we write together? He said, No, no, no. Why don't you go to Pakistan? So thanks to him, I met Becker. He said, That's just a break. And then he said, I said, oh, so can you help me int uh, interview Hamid Mir, who was the last journalist to interview Osama before he died. So he was the last one to interview him before 9-11. There was the other one who was the last one to interview him, period. Uh, and I said, oh, of course, uh, he has this very low-key attitude, completely different from me. So he has like, oh, of course, I'll help you. So I'll call him now and send him the message. And then, like, like very calm, he said, oh, I'm also interview Osama. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah. You can imagine me, you know, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and he said, yeah. And in fact, he told me uh, he was going to attack. And I said, uh-huh, oh, that's interesting. Let's talk. And then towards the end of the bus ride, when we, we are arriving at the, the dinner, uh, he talked to me about the kidnapping. And uh, towards the end, he left the bus and he said to me, and that's why I celebrate my birthday two times. In October, which is my original birthday when I was born, and in December, when I escape. And so I, s I thought to myself, that's the guy I want uh, on the book. And he was the seventh one, and it was a, a problem for me to write. Because, you know, with seven characters, I haven't read a book in my whole life, so seven characters. And people would say, it's too much, it's too many. And you were asking me why I do this, this, uh, this patchwork that go back and forth, there is no linear, because those people, they don't have a linear life. I mean, none of us have a linear life, but we take for granted a lot of things. They are not allowed to take for granted anything because their life goes like this. Here, one day you are here, the other day everything changed. So in the way I wanted to represent this in my writing, 
which was difficult to do, and sometimes I would, oh, I would give up how I'm going to do this, but it was very rewarding towards the end when I realized that, that, that uh, so there is this suspense because you don't know what's going to happen to them, and it's a patchwork, and it's because their lives is like back and forth, and it's not, it's not an easy life, mm -hmm. and I wanted the, the reader to feel that, so I think I've talked too much. No. Talk about no, the kid don't talk too much. Exactly, we, we're going to reach there. Uh, I just like uh, just one quick uh, observation, if you could make to us. Uh, how was your side of the story when you m you met this Brazilian journalist? What did you think at first? What was your idea of Brazil and stuff like that? Because then, as soon as you finish this, I'm going to go into. Well, I think we have connected that. immediately because she was the only journalist and was the only journalist. So that we the. The other uh, um, part, uh, participant in that workshop were uh, most of them are businessmen. Businessmen, yeah. So I mean, we, we can't like. we can't connect <laughs> with businessmen. So so we, we were able immediately to to connect and to talk and to gossip about everyone. So yeah, that. Uh, no, but do you remember the plane because we used. I mean, we were. I mean, it was an incredible week, and we would go on military planes, yeah, military C helicopters, C and this guy would say like, I thought he was Zen Buddhist or something like that, because he would say like very calm, and the world is all upside down, and he was very like, and, and it was really interesting, <laughs> because and how come he can be so calm after all that happened to him, you know? Now you explain. <laughs> Either it's, it goes very, very well, or it goes very bad in such <laughs> situations, <laughs> yes. And, and Becca, so uh, having said that, I'd like to hear from you. When did you choose to be a conflict journalist or at least somebody that would cover uh, rag radicalized groups, uh, Muslim groups in Asia? And how did this choice led to your kidnapping in the Philippines in 2012 and what you take out from uh, this ordeal? Uh, I think a few um, uh, Factors uh, on a personal level. I myself, I belong to Palestine. I've, I've, I've myself, like any other Palestinian who actually left from a place to another, from a war to another. So I've been like traveling till I landed working in, in Pakistan. Again, a country that um, I would say not an, it's an ideal place for a journalist because a lot of news. Uh, so there were, uh, Around around Pakistan, you have Afghanistan, you have Kashmir, the conflict uh, there. It's kind of uh, uh, kind of a, a troublesome area. Uh, so I was working there. I got the opportunity to interview Bin Laden. This actually made me more curious to understand more militant groups. And I just uh, just on the side, I believe always the word terrorist or terrorism is a political word loaded uh, that's why i prefer always to call them militants yeah yes they what they do is a terror no doubt they terrorize criminals absolutely right but when i want to define them as a journalist i call them militants so um so i started following militant groups from uh, pakistan uh, there are a few local groups into southeast asia it took me down to southeast asia i interviewed the most uh, I worked on a documentary about one of the most uh, um, non, I, let me call it, an, a militant group in Southeast Asia, that in Indonesia, which is called Jama'a Islamiyah or JI, those who were uh, responsible f uh, for the uh, Bali bombing in uh, 2002. 2002 and 2005, there were two attacks, actually. Uh, then uh, I worked several times in southern Philippines on the conflict the, uh, between the Muslims in the south and the government, mainly the militant, uh, there, are, there were militant groups, there are still militant groups there in Mindanao, Mindanao region, if, uh, if you're familiar with the area, it's in the southern part of the Philippines. So I've started following, tracing them down till they actually themselves <laughs> kidnapped me. Um, I walked myself into uh, into the kidnapping by um, I was working on a documentary about the uh, the conflict in, in Mindanao uh, back in 2012. I interviewed everyone should be in in, in, in that documentary. 
I was left only with an interview uh, that was supposed to be uh, conducted with um, a leader of, uh, one of the main leaders of a militant group there called Abu Sayyafi Group. Uh, Abu Sayyafi Group is uh, a militant group that usually, uh, most of the time, they kidnap for money and if you don't pay, they actually they kill their uh, their hostages. Yeah, the, uh, the same group that kidnapped they have actually beheaded two uh, Canadian hostages. That was right after I left. So um, I worked with a local journalist on on that uh, interview from that island. It's called Sulu Island. Um, I didn't work, I didn't do my homework on that journalist very well, and this is actually a lesson for those who are in media. When you, when you work with a producer, you should know who is your producer. Usually I do that, but the, uh, this, a lot of work, the intense work I have made on militant groups made me kind of overconfident, and that was my mistake. I didn't work on my producer very well. That producer was actually co in contact with them, and he planned my kidnapping with them. So I have walked w by myself to, the, uh, to their uh, hideout, to their camp, when without any effort from them to kidnap me. When I sat there, they said, you are a hostage. You are now our hostage. Brother, brother you are uh, our hostage. So I told him, please choose one of them, either a hostage or a brother. <laughs> Bo both <laughs> cannot go together. <laughs> yes. And uh, was there any point? That this lasted for one year and a half. Was there any point where you thought that you wouldn't survive? What were you thinking at the time? And, and what backer came out of uh, this kidnapping? As a journalist and as a person, of course. Well, I think uh, every day I was feeling that I won't survive. Every day I was having the hope that I'll, uh, I'll leave this place. So it's not uh, a phase that you feel you are weak and then you become strong. Every day I used to go very weak and collapse. Every day I used to feel that I'm strong and I'll, I'll be out. S what kept me be maybe motivated, what kept me alive, what kept me mentally strong that uh, in the third week I have almost collapsed completely. And I thought I'm actually I'm going to die. And I used to write on daily basis what is happening with me with the hope that maybe I can write a book. But when I used to go back and read what happened to me from day one till the third week, uh, it used to actually to give me more pain. So um, they used to allow me to, to walk to their kitchen. It's not a kitchen, it's just an open area where they have a fire and they come. So I immediately I thrown the papers in, in, in that fire and I burned everything I have written. And I've decided I'm going to live and I'm going to leave this place and I will start working on my escape. And actually this is what happened. It took me a year and a half, but I was able to, uh, uh, to manage uh, this. So uh, I, I put in front of me a target to achieve. Uh, this one of the main things that actually kept me mentally busy. I kind of, I was alone for throughout this, uh, this period. So I've started actually, uh, I started talking to myself. You, you cannot imagine, we can talk to ourselves. I used to make a lot of stories and I, I used to discuss it with myself. I tried to make it endless ones. Uh, I started then looking into the nature around me. Uh, it was a jungle, a, a huge, big jungle. Um, the jungles uh, the, uh, that are in South and Philippines are actually, um, proper jungles, T the trees more than 20 meters as an average. So I tried to connect with the, with the nature around me, with everything I see, other than the humans, unfortunately, who kidnapped me. Um, something that gave me kind of hope and love that actually uh, was missing, a cat that used to come to, to my hut, uh, a beautiful black cat with uh, green eyes. Um, I named that cat Julie. She used to come, I used to give her the food. Of course, most of the food they used to give me either rice or, or fish, and cats love fish. So I used to give that cat the fish, it used to stay with me. It, uh, the cat stayed with me like around eight months. In, in that cat, 
I actually found the love that I, have, I, I was missing. And I found that the human side, that unfortunately I couldn't find it from the humans who have actually took my, uh, my freedom. What has changed? Uh, number one, I believe that uh, we have around us so many things that we feel that it is uh, normal, we take it for granted. Few things, uh, small things, the restroom for example, uh, for 18 months there was no rest, uh, restroom. Uh, the moment I entered a restroom after 18 months, I said, long time no see. I'm, I'm really something, really something we, we think it is normal because it's available for us. The bed, um, it is something really, th those little blessings around us that we don't feel, we actually shouldn't take it for granted. Um, to me, when I, when I saw there is a, a bed, I remember when I reached the hospital, the moment I was, I got back my freedom, the nurse was telling me, I'm really sorry, uh, the bed is not clean. I told her, what you are talking about, I've spent 18 months in a bamboo, like a flooring even worse than this, sleeping. For me to sit in a, to sleep in a bed, something I, I miss, I'm, I'm really happy. To see the washroom, I'm really happy. To, to just to talk to humans, to connect to humans who could talk to you, who could actually give you some love, you, you can hug them, something that, you, uh, something that we have it every day around us, but actually we, we take it for granted. I think these little uh, small blessings that we have, we should not uh, take it for granted. We should always count these blessings and be thankful. Mm -hmm. Value the small things, value the persons, the dialogue, the interaction. I always want to add something. <laughs> yeah, add something, add something. So he lost 35 kilos do during those months. And I want to read uh, something about this, this, when he... The time when he, he was captive, when he left. Um, so, desde 2014, considero que nasci de novo, e é por isso que comemoro meu aniversário duas vezes por ano. Claro que mudei. Um sequestro deixa marcas, mas há algo que os sequestradores não conseguiram tirar de mim. O amor à vida, o amor às pessoas. Cada vez mais amo mais a vida, as pessoas e a minha profissão. Mais e mais. And taking from that point and going back to your uh, story as well, uh, your, your life, uh, you, you haven't been anything uh, through anything like that, I know. But you've been very close to a person that was killed by a militant group uh, while doing his job that he loved very much, which is, uh, who is uh, Sérgio Vieira de Mello. You, you made a documentary on him and I'd like to know from the dialogues with that person that was very fond of trying to construct dialogues, to construct conversation between uh, enemies and who was very much in love of the job uh, he embraced, what did you learn of this experience and uh, the way it ended and the product of it, which is your documentary? Uh, I, I think it's important to mention that I worked with Sergio Vira de Mello in East Timor yes. for the United Nations. So, uh, in fact, there, there was like rebels, uh, but it was not like Afghanistan or anything like that. So, basically, I'm a multilateralist. Sergio was a multilateralist. And he was the one, as you said, that would talk to everybody. What we see nowadays is that nobody talks to anybody. Uh, and also, the war on terror and everything that happens after 9-11, uh, in fact, uh, Sergio's death is uh, related to 9-11, and so it's all connected. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, this book has everything to do with the documentary, yes. in a way. Um, so what happened after 9-11, and what happened in Iraq, uh, what happened in Afghanistan, is that Americans or the Western don't talk to the people, which was something that Sergio would do. He would talk to everybody with the criminals, with the non-criminals, but we would talk to everybody. So, and also this book is an exercise, and because what we see after 9-11 and after war on terror, and we have been seeing from those 23 years, is Islamophobia, is we, 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 are f we fear the other, but we don't know the other. We know a stereotype of the other. So this is an exercise of empathy, which was something that Sergio had. Uh, so what I learned in East Timor with Sergio was like this exercise of talking to everybody, 
this exercise of believing that we together as countries can live together and can work uh, it can, and can build a, a world that is multilateral. Mm -hmm. And what we see nowadays is not a world that is multilateral. Mm -hmm. So basically, I think that's my answer. And just to add to that, we have this example of Sergio Vieira de Mello, very important. Another example is that of uh, the diplomat uh, Bustami, the Brazilian one that was head of the International Agency on uh, Chemical Weapons, that was basically expelled from that organization by pressure from the US just because the they wouldn't let him do his work, which was to make inspections mm -hmm. in Iraq. And I have a very small example of how uh, those things work. So I, was, I did the film about Sergio Vieira de Amelo, but the UN didn't want, I mean, and I wanted the Secretary General to show the film at the UN, okay? And I was not able to get this thing. And then Richard Holbrook, who used to be uh, uh, se se not Secretary of State, but under Secretary of State, and he worked with Madeleine Albright. He was a very powerful, uh, he was an ambassador at the UN, so he was a very powerful person. He knew everybody, and he represents the United States. So, and he was interviewing the film. And then we had a screening, was in a Tribeca Film Festival. He went, and he, was, he got very emotional about the, 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 um, the film, and then towards the end he said, how can I help you? And I said to him, it was on a Saturday, okay? I said to him, I want a screening with the Secretary General at the United Nations. On Tuesday, someone from the United Nations called me and we got the screening. Well, so, and, and for me, it's a, it's a small example how things work, you know? So the United States say, they do. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's like that, you know? And I'd like to hear your take also about the presence and the legacy of the United States in the region and the movements that you've been covering and the importance and the influence of US still nowadays in that region and those groups that you cover. I hope uh, you will like what I, you'll uh, like what I'm going to say, but uh, my, my impression about the US policies and uh, mainly in South Asia where I actually covered intensively and mainly in Afghanistan, it was disastrous, no doubt. The United States uh, came to Afghanistan in order to eliminate Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. They ended, ended after 20 years of negotiating the Taliban and bringing them into power, sharing power with the Afghan government. They spent, st some estimations say $3 trillion. The official um, numbers are $2.3 trillion. They've s they have spent over 20 years on Afghanistan. What was the result? Uh, on 15th August 2021, when uh, the Taliban entered Kabul, the Afghan army completely disappeared, melted. The president escaped, and no one from the government was there. Uh, the corruption level in Afghanistan throughout these 20 years was terrible. According to the, uh, th there is a general inspector for uh, Afghanistan assigned by the U.S. government to inspect the money that was, uh, was approved by the Congress to be spent in Afghanistan. That report says 40% of the uh, ordinary Afghan citizen goes for paying bribes. They pay 40% of their income. Like if your income is $100, $40 would go to bribe people so things can go. The, one of the uh, Afghan uh, diplomats says, and I'm quoting him exactly what he said, he says, the, Af the ordinary Afghan, from his certificate of birth to his certificate of death, and in between, he needs to pay a bribe. 20 years of claiming, reconstructing Afghanistan, or building Afghanistan, Till today, 30% of Afghanistan will only have access to electricity, only. Uh, the poverty rate, uh, rate in Afghanistan, the poor, the under the poverty line, before the Americans left, it was about 79. Today, it's 97. Two thirds of the, Afghan, the Afghans are actually, uh, uh, according to the UN reports, they are facing hunger feminine, two-thirds, I'm talking about two-thirds, 
it's not one third, two third. Unemployment, 70 percent. I, I really don't know where these 2.3 trillion have gone actually. It was no doubt a disastrous uh, uh, policies in, in Afghanistan. While they brought a government uh, to, uh, in Afghanistan and, th uh, and they, uh, it was the Afghan government with a president, at the same time the, the US started negotiating the Taliban without taking in, 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 in confidence or bringing with them the Afghan government itself. They reached the, um, an understanding with the Taliban in Doha, in Qatar, what is known the Doha Agreement. The Afghan government was not part of it. And the most shocking and surprising thing in this agreement, which a few actually, uh, um, I don't know if you guys got the chance to read it or not, but a few knew about it. The agreement was signed between the US government and the Islamic State of Afghanistan. It was not signed by, between the US and the Taliban movement, no. It was signed by, uh, uh, with the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. The Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is the name of the government that the Taliban used to have from 1996 till 2001. Now when they came back to power, they are using the same name, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. The U.S. signed an agreement with a government. Uh, at the same time, there was another government in, in Kabul. No doubt the Americans were trying to leave Afghanistan. They used to spend around $9 million a day in Afghanistan. It was for them also a, a loss. So this is, I mean, one of the examples about how, how, how bad uh, their policies were in, in, in that part of the world. And trying to mix here this uh, chat between uh, personal experience and professional one, uh, having this geopolitics in mind. Of course, he talked about Afghanistan, but we could say basically the same about Iraq. We could say basically the same about what happened in Libya as well. Uh, this whole trail that we tend to forget very easily. But I want to go back also sub the, uh, about the talking about the nature of our profession, journalism. We know that. Uh, rarely in the whole history have we be been able to access so much information from uh, original sources with the help of technology as we do today. We have an access which is crazy and even so we don't manage to tell the stories maybe with the whole complexity and uh, see all the sides and as we are hearing right here. But I'd, I'd like to know because from your experience as well Simone you are this TV background, but then after working all over the world, you came to be in Portugal working for Publico with a very specific mission, which was, which was to digitalize uh, that newspaper. And uh, what was on your mind when you started doing that? How was this process? And how did it affect the consumption of news and the way it's produced and uh, aired and uh, put to people? had a tradition, a digital tradition, but that was very, very bad at that time. So basically we have to redo every, all the website and more than the website, you know, it's about mentality. And it's very, and, and mainly in a newspaper, uh, it's very hard to change mentality. I'm talking about 10 years ago, but I would talk about the same thing today. So it didn't change there. And there is a lot of resistance for, from older people to learn the skills that we need to learn. But more than that, I think uh, what I want to say is that there are this essence of journalism doesn't change no matter uh, what kind of technology you're using. And what I think today is that, for example, most of the organizations, they don't have international foreign correspondents anymore. Um, they don't invest in international coverage. So what you have is the fast food of the news. So there is a, uh, a wire that comes from Timor and goes all around the world. And I witnessed this from the other side. Because when I work at the United Nations, I remember one day there was a huge protest, but nothing happened. And the wire that Reuters sent all over the place was that, you know, there was like a, a riot and all that. Because I remember that my mother called me or someone called me, oh, what's happening in East Timor? And there was nothing, it was a protest and it ended. Okay, yeah. So I think we live in the fast food, and I, mean, I, I thought that 20 years ago, 
here, now it's much worse. But what I want to say is nothing substitutes you interviewing someone or you being in the field, no matter what kind of subject you are mm -hmm. covering. So I, I feel that, because I'm interviewed a lot nowadays, because of the book, of, because of the film, and I feel very like, come on, how come people can send me questions for me to answer by email, or for me to send audios? Because that's, that's not the essence of journalism. Because what I want to hear, and how can I build the stories, look at you if you're lying or not, if your eyebrow does, does like this, if you are nervous, and you know, you have to be with people to understand that. Uh, if I'm not with people, I don't know, you know, so even a call that you do, or a Skype, or, no, Skype is old, but, you know, no matter what, Zoom, or, you know, it's not the same thing, and in the book I feel that. For example, men, men are terrible on calls, okay? So I interview all of them in person, but then after COVID, I have to interview them, either calls, and the general was, I mean, I couldn't get anything from him, you know? A backer is different because he's a journalist, so, and also Rafi, who is the Afghan, was extremely difficult. And when I was with them, in front of them, it was much easier. Because we are like engaging, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. So what I would tell you is like, no matter if you do video, if you do digital, if, no matter what you do, don't get away from people and from the subject. Don't think that you are sitting down on a newsroom or at your home in, in front of a computer and you do Google and that's all. It's not. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to say. Now to you, Becker. I'd like to know about your experience at uh, Arab News. It also had been through a uh, transition time to digital very strongly. And if you also feel that this essence that uh, Simone is talking about and uh, the way you can adapt your work for different formats or platforms or things like that, do you think that uh, this changes the way you are going to approach uh, the themes and uh, the people. Okay, so I might give an example of what I am doing currently. Um, I look after a project that is for the Independent, the UK uh, a newspaper. It's a digital newspaper, and I'm doing there the, the, the same newspaper, but in in, a, in the Urdu language. So we have a team. Um, I come from television. I spent more than 20 years in television. Then I took a little bit, a year, uh, a gap. Then I've st I, I thought I should start the, uh, enter this digital world, the digital media. After working with a team of more than 60, I mean the main team that we have, we've started with a normal newsroom. We are online, we, we don't have uh, print for that. But still, we adopted the traditional newsroom. Yes, we have the social media team, we have the video team, we have the, the, uh, the producers, editors, head of the newsroom, and, and all of that. But I, I started over, over the years, for, for more than three years of running this operation, that we are actually facing a lot of issues. One of the main issues that those who are at the desk, like producers or editors, they know only text. They know nothing about digital. The team who are social media team, they, they only know how to write the best caption for a tweet or how to post on, on Insta or in, on Facebook and all of that. They are more of a social media, uh, I, I call them boys because young, they were young, uh, they are young, uh, but they have no knowledge about journalism. Sometimes they, used to, they, they do mistakes and, and they don't check facts. So you'll find numbers wrong and information wrong. Then we have the video team, who are, again, different generation. Those who used to work on television and want the story to be like the TV story, and those, the young uh, boys and girls who want those quick and fast beat of stories. They edit on their phones and they, they want to publish. So I took a decision last year with, with the team that we will turn the whole newsroom into a digital newsroom meaning those who are sitting in social media team, they need to learn all the effects, all the rules that we have it as journalists. Those who are uh, knows only text, they need to know how to write, uh, how, uh, what is social media, and they need, they need to know how to edit videos, how to make videos, and how to shoot videos, even through their phones. So we went in a, th a painful process for over nine months where we've trained everyone 
where everyone can do anything. Still, we have uh, specialized desks for social media, for the, the, the text, the content that should be published, and, and all of that. Later, I start finding another challenge that still I have a head for the social media, I have a head for the, uh, for the publishing, we have a head for the video, and everyone is like the boss of his own. He might uh, refuse others' uh, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, request to publish to immediately, to, to, to give a priority for a store or another. We went into another level that we called it one in newsroom, one editor. So one newsroom, a digital newsroom, and then one person. We have picked up the best four from the team, and they were called the floor editors, where they can actually take, call, uh, uh, take the call or the shot throughout their shifts, where they can actually know this story should go immediately, this story should, should wait. No one can tell them, no, I'm not going to tweet it now. I'm not going to do the video. He will say, give the priority for this one, publish this one first. And somehow we could feel that we're starting streamlining and, and, and moving forward. So this is just a quick highlight about how um, we've tried to, to go digital. And just uh, this morning, before I flown from uh, um, uh, com uh, coming here to Rio, I was having a meeting with the same team. And we agreed on training them further, and we planned to call them the digital journalists. Everyone, so we used to have, uh, first of all, we used to have a TV journalist. Then we started to talking about uh, a video journalist. And I think now it is, it is the, uh, I was uh, discussing it with Simone and I told her this is the future. She told me, no, this is the current. You don't know what's coming in, in a few days, which I actually, I agree with you. So taking from that point and just adding from a, a personal experience, that is very true what you just said about the compartmentalization of uh, newsrooms in big uh, media groups like Global, for instance, where you have different people maybe doing the same thing for different platforms or formats and how uh, everybody should be trying to only adapt to do the same news for different formats and stuff, and this is a work that takes uh, you know, some energy and stuff. And I w I'd like to open for questions from the audience, but just to finish the last question, I'd like to know from you and from you, Becker, as well, Simone, uh, what do you view as the biggest challenges for journalism in our time, being a Brazilian journalism and looking at Brazil, like uh, even if from Lisbon or uh, now you're, you're here, what are the main challenges? Is it Technology, approach, subjects, what do you see at the main as the main challenges for journalism? I think there is a pressure to be fast and a pressure to publish no matter what, really fast. I think that's a problem because, and I, I also think there is a, a lot of opinion, you know, uh, there is something about journalists nowadays that everybody gives an opinion about something. I don't want to hear your opinion. <laughs> I want to hear the facts. I want to hear a story. You know, journalism at the end of the day is about checking facts uh, and telling a story. Uh, and I think we are going far away from that to say, you know, opinion, opinion, opinion. And everybody gives opinion about anything, you know. So uh, the Queen Elizabeth dies and then there is that guy who does finance talking about the death of the Queen Elizabeth. Oh, come on. No, I don't want to hear your opinion about the death of Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> Uh, so I think that is a problem. I don't know, there is a lot of pressure. Brazil is living in a, in a time that is, uh, let's say we just finish a very bad time and we are starting a new time and, in, and it gives a lot of, uh, there's a lot of pressure from all the sides. And then uh, we have to be, I mean, we have to do what we need to do, but at the same time we know that journal that, that newsrooms, and the, the companies don't spend much money in training people. For example, when I enter uh, a TV, I have role models. I have people like, like older than me that, were, that, were, that spend time with me, teaching me things. And I don't see this in newsrooms anymore. And you just, you know, you just leave a kid mm -hmm. that 18, 19, or 20 in the middle of, of, of a jungle and uh, without any orientation. And that's, I think, is a big problem. Not only in Brazil, everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I see this in Portugal happening a lot. 
That's the importance of human capital and the knowledge that uh, should be passed by the older generation to the new ones. And we don't see. Basically, the same question for you. And how do you think that technology can help in these new times and what is to come? And also, how can it be tricky? The use of too much technology, maybe here and there, can also get in the way it of actually good journalism. It helped a lot. Um, if I just recall throughout my career now, more than 25 years, when we started transmitting, like we want to go live, used, there used to be only one um, uh, SNG, the satellite news gathering, to transmit in, like in the whole city. Sometimes you don't find it. And it used to be very expensive. I remember we used to pay $2,500 for 10 minutes only. Later, we've started using the FTB. It made the cost completely, I mean, dropped the cost. Then we, when, when we used to go live from different locations, we used to use what we used to call it BGAN, then it's a 3G. Now we are using internet from, uh, through the internet, we can uh, is easily stream live and, and, and do and do everything. So if, in, in terms of the cost, it has really remarkably um, dropped the cost of any uh, news operation. In terms of how quick you are, we are now very quick in reporting. Uh, more quali the quality of work as well, uh, the, the flow of information, uh, the volume of information. Certainly th the technology has added into this uh, a big deal, I believe. The other challenge is the parallel kind of media or a flow of information that usually comes from social media that sometimes comes from, from what are now the labeled or known as influencers. This is a serious threat to the industry. Uh, I can't call it exactly a threat, but it needs to be defined well. And journalists and the professional work should be defined well. Journalism is a profession. We have our rules, we have our ethics, I cannot see a video and I, I publish it immediately. I need to verify the source. I need to verify the date. I need to make sure it's not being deep faked, for example, before I run it. But a social media influencer, not all, some, or those are in social media, they would just publish it. So this big difference between someone who is um, not in the profession and someone in the profession. So I think this is one of the, I guess, challenges that needs to be redefined uh, uh, more. We need to name the things, a journalist is a professional. Social media influencer is a social media influencer. Never, uh, can't be a source, can be for me a source that I can verify. But for the public, I don't think he is a source of an information. Uh, one of the challenges I believe always been and until today, governments, intelligence agencies, the pressure they put on journalists, um, uh, the angles they want to take the information uh, they, uh, uh, to, to uh, kind of censor some information, some, uh, some uh, they don't want you to run a video, for example, an information, or they want to plant an information in your story. Um, one of the main, I, I think that the freedom of, of, of uh, um, speech, freedom of information, flow of information is one of the main challenges before and actually it remain uh, till today. Very good. So I think that now, yeah, I, I think that now we can open for questions for the audience. How do you do that? Uh, well, is there a mic or people just stand up and say the questions? No, no if you are students of journalism, you have to have questions. Yes. <laughs> There's a question there. I don't know exactly all your past, but you become more or less a specialist in conflict. Uh, or you know, Sergio Vieira de Mello and uh, your book, and uh, you've been to very many conflict zones. Um, how, how does that, um, well, the, the question is impartiality in media. Is, uh, it, it's not hard, especially after the election that we, we had, everybody blames the media of not being partial, of being very impartial, uh, not being impartial. And uh, I once uh, heard somebody say, uh, a journalist say, the media is not 
it, it is partial. You just have to see what type of media, wh which side the media is taking, and more or less analyze it from that side. So uh, it's, I thought it was interesting. You just, uh, I don't know, the big media, it's hard to tell. H how do you keep uh, impartiality, uh, especially after you've become more or less a different person, when you see so much uh, good and bad? And Bakker, too, you, you, when you see so much so many, uh, good things and bad things, uh, what what is how do you see the human being? Uh, uh, do you still see it in an impartial way, um, in in terms of future? I, I think nobody is impartial. I mean, when I decide to tell these stories, is already my point of view. Uh, so why I didn't decide to tell another story only about Americans or only about so I think we all have point of views. It doesn't mean that uh, press <laughs> has to be, let's say, partial. I mean, you have to give facts, and you have to give in a way that you, the listener, you, the reader, you make your own conclusions. I mean, you make your, uh, and, and that's why I come back to the opinion, because we, it's, it's, it's cheaper to put lots of people talking about no matter what, than to really, do journalism, which is send them to the places. I mean, Marcos Duchot is there again, I'm quoting him again, because he went to all the conflict zones that you can imagine, you know, so he was there, he saw. Uh, so we don't do this anymore. Who is doing this right now? Now, you, you ask someone who lives in the place to do a, a, a call, and I'm not complaining, you, know, you understand, it's everywhere like this. So this is not journalist. And I think the, the partiality or impartiality has to do with that. The other thing is that the news we get from the outside, from foreign news, are all from uh, Western media. So the Associated Press, Reuters. So we don't get from the other side of the world. So we only have one vision. So partiality is already there, you know? And, and most of the time, mainly nowadays, the person who gets this information doesn't know how to pr process the information, doesn't have the knowledge. I remember when I was in, uh, doing international, in the international desk of Journal Nacional that sometimes, you know, most of those wires, they come up with mistakes. Mm -hmm. And people reproduce the mistakes, you know. Uh, and I remember co questioning one thing that was very obvious a mistake. And, 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 I, and I make the, the intern call the Associated Press. You know, no, you're going to call them because this is wrong. Um, and, it, and we lost this capability uh, and, and in the newsrooms to, you know, to understand what's false and, mm -hmm. and right and to question things. To question. A journalist has to question things, to be curious and to question, mm -hmm. not take everything for, oh, it's true. It's like this, let's talk about something else with the spokesperson. Mm -hmm. I mean, journalism is not putting all the spokespersons to talk, you know. And that's what we do. Oh, the State Department has its spokesperson, and then he talks. Oh, there is no drones. No, the drones didn't kill anybody. Mm -hmm. They killed the terrorists. No, no. Uh, the New York Times was able to tell everybody, saying the Pentagon is lying because they kill an innocent man. And it was only possible because, they ha because it happened next to Kabul. And then they had a reporter to send. But most of the drone attacks, they, did, they don't happen in Kabul, they happen in the rural areas, so nobody sees. So the Pentagon, the State Department, the Pentagon, they say, oh, and, and when I say the Pentagon, I can say the same thing with, for the Pakistanis, for the Israelis, for the Iraqs, you know, all the governments still there, but they, their version, and their version, and we see CNN or see TV, and it's all like a spokesperson telling mm -hmm. the truth. Exactly. And we're not checking. Exactly, yeah. We've just been through this whole history about the balloons, the Chinese balloons in the US and Canada and stuff, and nobody knows exactly what it was till nowadays. So you're your talking on that, no. that question as well. Yeah, uh, no, it, it, because you had, um, you, you specialized in conflict. So you've gone through, you've seen a lot of good and bad, a lot of bad, more than we have, and even you spent uh, as, as a captive. How do you um, see yourself, I mean, you, you, 
you change as the person to a certain degree and you know, what you how you appreciate uh, but do you still see others or do you still see the human beings um, in a in a good light in a good uh, light is, is there a, is the cup half full or ha empty in for future Yes, certainly. Um, yes, I was focusing on the bad, but I think the good is more than the bad in this life. And I think this, uh, to be always optimistic, to be, to, to be always positive, I think this is what can help us to change. Um, and if, uh, I'm not sure if most of the audience are journalists or in media. Um, I think one of the things that we need to begin with is ourselves as journalists. Uh, sometimes uh, we journalists actually misuse the name that we have. We, we try to influence people. Uh, sometimes when even you are in a bank, you want to, to be the first because you're a journalist. When you are at the airport, you want to cross first because you're a journalist. So I think we need to start with ourselves to be good before we um, uh, try to, to change the world. We, we claim that we present the truth or we try to, to report the truth to people. We need to begin with ourselves. We journalists talk a lot, actually. We talk a lot. I think sometimes we need to shut up. We need to listen more than we talk. This will help us, actually, to understand and to change. So I believe it begins from within us as, as journalists. Good afternoon. Um, Taking 9-11's transmission in media, how do you think it changed the viewer's perspective in violence? That is my question. <laughs> for, for both of you. <laughs> okay, I think, I, uh, so there is kind of a stereotype that uh, we uh, write after 9-11, mostly. All Muslim terrorists, for example. This is maybe not in this part of the world, but I see this a lot in the West and in the U.S. mainly. Uh, this stereotyping when if people labeled the same, this is one of the actually, one of them. And this has actually led to a lot of violence in different parts of, of the world. Uh, and that's, again, that was the impact of the media, the way the media present things. I saw reporters coming from the West reporting about conflicts in different places, and they know nothing about the culture of, of that country at all. Uh, they don't know what is uh, the, the, the context of a story. They come from New York, and they believe in Kandahar there is McDonald's, for example, where uh, Kandahar hardly has restaurants back then in, in, in during the war. So they, they don't know the culture. They come with their culture, and they report through the eyes uh, of the way they have lived. Uh, so th this is, uh, it has no doubt inci incited a lot of violence because the way media has reported so many incidents uh, around the world. And I focus on Afghanistan because this is one of the main areas I've worked in. Uh, in Pakistan, for example, I sometimes meet John Davis who said, oh my God, how do you live there? I say, like any other country. I say, when you were there, normal. Uh, someone, do you, do you live in camps? Women all are um, uh, you know, covered. So these stereotyping that we see from media uh, th this actually uh, has added into this. One, th one, uh, this is one element. The other one is um, the policies of superpowers, and I, I would say mainly the U.S. in the region, mainly in the Middle East, has actually led into a lot of uh, con continuation of this uh, conflict. The unlimited, um, unchecked support to Israel, for example, certainly is something that makes no one happy, no one pleased with the U.S. policies in the region. No doubt about it. So policies, the, uh, the, the political systems in the Middle East and Asia in general, if I want to talk about the area where I work, most of it are unpopular. Some dictatorships are there. All of this would, people would, are suppressed, people are under pressure. This would all lead into, into, uh, into all of, of this violence. If you go back, actually, and what, what uh, how Bin Laden, for example, uh, tried to sell his idea of 9-11 and the attacks. He believes, 
uh, that United States is the main source of evil in the world, and he should attack the United States. It is not an endorsement of his statement, but this is how he portray uh, his, uh, uh, himself and wh what he has done. Why? Because he believes the United States, number one, came into the region with its forces and has, uh, it has bases in the region. And this is kind of an, an indirect occupation for the region. Secondly, its policies mainly towards the Palestinian issue. I don't believe in, 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 in his ideology, but no doubt he was able to sell his, uh, his point of view. So uh, this has led to all of these violence, this conflict uh, that you would see. 9-11 was the beginning of so many wars, so many conflicts, from Afghanistan to Iraq to Syria to the Arab Spring that unfortunately turned into an autumn, Lib Libya in, in, in a mess, Tunisia in, in, a, in a bad situation currently, Egypt, again, unfortunately, in a bad uh, um, you know, political and economic, uh, economical conditions, other countries being affected and impacted in the region because of these policies, including Pakistan, Afghanistan completely. The country, uh, when, when you say 97% of the people there are under the line of poverty. 70% are unemployed. What is left? Nothing. I just want to go back. I mean, the, the attacks were seen, by, watched by 2 billion people in the world, live. And for these 2 billion people live, the bad guys are the Muslims. Okay? So then you perceive the whole Muslim world as terrorists. And that idea the media kept doing th this whole time. So there is a character here, but we could say to other people that she goes and see Matisse in the Museum of Philadelphia. There is a couple, and the couple say, look at them, they're coming, be careful, because they're wearing a hijab. So someone who has a hijab is, is a criminal. And we forget that the majority of the victims of Daesh, the majority of the victims of Taliban, the majority of the Al Qaeda, they are Muslims. They are not us. They are not the Westerns. So today, uh, Muslims are dying because of those groups, not the Westerns are dying. And our perception, for example, this morning, where is my? This morning, uh, Becca gave me this. Okay, and we were there. Me, he put me like I'm not going to do it right, but he did like this. Immediately, everybody in the airport started to look at me, because our perception is, uh, you know, if I'm wearing this, and then he put a cap, and then he looked like like a terrorist, you know, and then everybody was looking at him. So, uh, so our perceptions are, you know, if she's wearing this, if she's wearing a hijab. It's because she, uh, and there was a guy getting through security, and he was from Asia, he was not a Brazilian. Uh, he was speaking another language. And when he looked at me, and Becca saw this, and when he looked at me, he was like, what? And then he came back and he looked again. So if I was in the US and was wearing this, probably I would be stopped in, the, in all the check-ins in the airport. And this is a perception that was created that all Muslims are bad guys. So you see Hollywood films or you see Netflix. I mean, Muslims are the bad guys. Uh, so that's something when you talk about violence. There's, uh, there is the violence itself, like of those people jumping and the building. And there is one very important thing. There is no one I talked during this process that didn't, the first thing they would say it was like, we are so sorry for those 3, 000, almost 3,000 people that died. But they have won 9-11. We have been a 9-11 since then. Our 9-11 hasn't stopped, hasn't finished. And that's, it's the feeling of that region, you know? And you know, and you go out of your country and, and people have prejudice. It's not easy. I mean, there is one character, she lives in, in, in Vienna. She doesn't look like African. She speaks perfect German and people treat her as, and she doesn't feel at home. Uh, so the violence is much more than just the violence itself, but it's this violence that's 
within our society that we judge the other that we don't know, like they, we are all perceived as terrorists. We were with one group, one militant group where, bef with the attacks, that was Al-Qaeda. We ended up with the Taliban in, 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 uh, in Pakistan, with the ISIS uh, in, in Iraq. It used to, uh, they used to call it ISI, Islamic State in Iraq. Then they moved to Syria, then they became ISIS, Islamic State in, in Iraq and Syria. We started having different pockets of Al-Qaeda everywhere in the Middle East. That was all. That all happened after 9-11. No. Okay. Uh, Simone, again, amazing book. Congratulations. And if you could answer, uh, we met amazing women in your book. And we know, as journalists, that women are the most affected in war, in climate change, in inequalities, poverty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In your work, Marcelo and, and Becker, and in your work in reading this book, and Simone writing this book, it changes your woman's perception. Maybe your engagement in women's cause, because I, I don't know. As journalists, we also live in a, I don't know if that's this word in English, a banalization of evil. You know, with all the digital, with all the media, we heard so many news, bad news, terrible news about women that we, okay, another problem with the women, violence with the women, poverty. So maybe it, it changed your perception? Uh, my next book is about women. I mean, it's about, uh, I will tell the, the subject, although people think that we shouldn't tell the subject of a book because someone is going to steal the idea. But you know, it's still yeah. ideas. <laughs> It's a lot of work because you have to steal the idea and do the book. And most of people, they only want to steal, they don't do the things. <laughs> but uh, my next book is going to be, is I'm, I've been living abroad for 25 years. I don't know Brazil. I mean, I have, I mean, even when I lived here, I know like Rio and we don't know really Brazil. And my idea is to, my idea, no, I, I'm already on it, so I'm doing already. So it's to look to Brazil through the eyes of women refugees women who came from different countries, because if you're a black refugee, your experience of Brazil is completely different as a Syrian experience of Brazil, as a Venezuelan experience of Brazil. So that's my next book. Regarding the women itself that I met, and the women are very strong. I think the characters of the women in the book, they're really strong. All of them impressed me a lot. Uh, and also, they have, uh, because our visions like, for example, Afghanistan, oh, the women, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they have a very different vision about that because they don't want the Western to tell them what a woman has to do or not to do, you know. Um, they want the, the change to be within their society, you know. And there are lots of, you know, cultural stuff on it and it's not uh, something, again, linear. For example, there is one character, the, the Iraq woman, who lives in, in, in the US. I mean, she decides that her daughter will not use the hijab to protect herself. And she prefers that her daughter is, uh, that they think that her daughter is Puerto Rican for her to be safer. So can I imagine that you pretend not to be Brazilian because you not feel safe somewhere else? It's very, it's very strong. This is very hard. It's very painful. You, you are, you are, you are, you are giving away your identity because people would think that you are a terrorist or put you in danger. So, so it's the opposite. They think they are terrorists, so, so they suffer. So I think the women are extremely, the women that I met, are extremely uh, uh, strong, but also they have their view of women's emancipation and all that, which is not necessarily our view of wearing mini skirts, okay? Uh, I don't know if I answer, yeah, I do. You. About women, you have to say, is that Wo Women's Day, please. Women's please. Day, first of all, um, <laughs> happy Women's Day <laughs> to all. <laughs> um, uh, let me tell you something interesting. Uh, during my kidnapping, those who only who were actually kind and used to come to my hut and to tell me we are sorry for what happened, they were women. 
because the community that kidnapped me, they were all, uh, it was like a, a community, men, women, and, and children also. So uh, the wife of, of the leader, the one who was responsible for my kidnapping, she used, she's, she's a, um, a nurse. She used sometimes when I feel unwell, she used to come to see me. Then, and and she, she speaks uh, good English. She used to come and to tell me, I'm really sorry for, for what is happening to you. I can't do anything, but I can bring for you food. Uh, I can, whatever you want. I remember once she brought for me from the city. The city is, you need uh, to send someone three hours or more uh, from uh, those mountains to get something. She, she got me a burger, for example. So they were very kind. Uh, so if I would recall this kind of, you know, uh, what women, uh, in media, uh, I would talk about the newsroom that we have. We have uh, about 45% women and uh, 55 men. And I'm trying to make it 50-50, actually. I certainly believe um, one of our main editors, under her more than 20, she's a woman. A strong journalist. Uh, I'm uh, proud actually of working with her. So I believe very much in, 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 in women's role. Uh, uh, journalist, I... I Simone, the one who actually I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to her to, to actually featureize me in, in her book and to invite me um, to talk to you. It was all an effort uh, by a, a woman. I don't know if I answered your uh, question or not. The advantage to have him here is that he signs books also. So we in Campinas, we were in Campinas and we stayed like two hours signing 200 books because as he was there, everybody wants my signing and his autograph too. And every person and each person that stops, who stops there, he would, he would ask, so what do you study? So what do you want in life? So it would take like a few hours. <laughs> Good evening. Um, do you guys have some advice for those who think about becoming a journalist in the future? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about. No, you start. Come on. Yeah. I always okay. start. Yeah. I'm a woman. I'm First of all, I think it's. Uh, I mean, it's really great that you want to become a journalist. Um, it is two things. A passion and a mission, I believe. If you don't have the passion, you can't be a good journalist. And if you don't understand, understand the mission, then again, the passion won't really help you. So um, if you have the passion, try to understand the industry and the profession, and I'm sure you'll be doing great. One, two, make sure that um, you inform and you do not impose on people. Your mission is to inform. Uh, Throughout those 18 months in my kidnapping, I really keep thinking about the profession, what I'm doing. It is prof my profession that has landed me in this trouble. Trust me, throughout this time, I used to believe more and more about what I'm, I'm, I'm doing. That's why, after all of what happened, i still doing the same job. And I went back to the Philippines five times. And I worked in a documentary, and I entered not exactly the same area where I was kidnapped, but I went to the south and I filmed the documentary that I wanted. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a passion, could, uh, could put you in trouble sometimes, but it is really great. The last advice, and I say it, and I, I, I hope I can also myself uh, follow, uh, follow this, that try always to tell the story yourself, never become the story. Never become the story. We shouldn't like what happened to um, many journalists who were shot, who were killed, and they became the story, when they were actually pursuing a story. Try always to take risks, but it should be always calculated. Nothing worth not to come back. No story worth not to come back. Uh, <laughs> oh my God, the, the, after this answer, I need to answer something else? No. <laughs> Uh, there is one thing that I notice in newsrooms nowadays. It, it's a very, it's, it's a generational thing, and you can perhaps tell me more than about it. 
which is in my time, I mean, when I was in my 20s, you no, know, I would enter in a newsroom and I would know that, that I could, you know, go all the way up. For me, all the way up was not to become a boss, although I have been a boss since I was 28, which is, my, my father used to say that I'm very bossy, so perhaps it was because <laughs> of that. Um, but there was like, a, you, could, you could see a future. Now these things are very different. And you guys, I mean, at least that's what I see or people tell me. For example, now, and for good and for bad, you don't have patience. That's how I feel. Because I had to have, you know, you have to do a little sacrifice. So for example, I remember my first year at Global. No, they asked me to decoupar desfile de escola de samba. So it's very hard, people, because you stay the whole night, you know, writing what is going on in the, in the parade, you know? But I learned something from that. And what I think nowadays uh, that you guys, when I say you guys, I mean your generation, doesn't have patience. You want to be happy, you wanna, so if anything happens that you don't like, you just quit, uh, which is very different from my time and from my way of thinking since today, you know, even writing this book, I would do a few sacrifice because I really think that was an important thing to say. I'm not saying that you were worse than, than my time. I'm just saying it's, it's different, you know, uh, because, uh, and perhaps you're right. And it's not a question of right and wrong, it's different. And I don't, uh, and, and I think you have to have a little bit of patience. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise it's, because then you give up, you know? I don't know if I, I answer your question, but. And just let me add something uh, by experience and about what we've been talking here this afternoon, is that at least the good thing is that in a country like Brazil, in a city like Rio de Janeiro, but Sao Paulo and all over, there's lots of things to be done. We need to rethink the way we cover this country, our cities, our problems, because, uh, as I said in the beginning, we are not uh, in war, at war with anybody, but we are at war lots of times with ourselves. So uh, if you want to cover land dispute in the country here in Brazil, very risky. We should learn a lot from your experience how to do it, to go to uh, an area which is disputed by uh, big back. farms and to come back and to come back with the story that you can tell. And also for, s for a young journalist that wants to work, even if he, he or her uh, or she, uh, she wants to, to work in a city like Rio, how do you do to, make a, to go and produce a story in, uh, in Rocinha today where you'll be talking to this or that people, the next day you'll be there covering uh, an armed conflict with the same people and with the same police that were there. We need to uh, rethink ways of doing this safely, of going and coming back with our stories, but facing all these challenges that we have. And this is a good thing, because yeah. there are lots to be said about yeah, this country. Uh, then I just want to, to finalize and say, you know, there are lots of stories to be told. That's it, that's what we're saying. And they're there. You just need to look and tell. Thank you so much. Um, how did you guys prepare yourself to deal with such a huge moment in your professional career? How we prepare how ourselves? You, prepare you just leave and things coverage. happen. <laughs> just I mean, leave it with your eyes wide you open and just, you know, and things just arrive. You know, they happen. Uh, and you have to be aware that they might. I mean, you have to be open for them to happen. Uh, I don't know if I answer you. <laughs> and then you prepare. We st I studied a lot, okay? If I'm going to interview someone, I will study about this guy. I will never, you know, uh, there are people who interview me about the book, they never read, then they don't read the book. That, uh, that for me will never happen. I would read the book. And I used to work with people who would spend the whole night reading the book to be able to, to interview the guy the next day. You know, so if you want to do it, you have to do it the right way. It's not just a Googling one uh, Wikipedia that's going to say, solve your problem. I mean, and to be, for you to be like uh, prepared, you know, there is a saying, I think it's a Jewish saying that you have uh, in synagogues that you have to know who is in front of you. And, and basically they, it means 
God. But in that case, in our case, it's like you have to be, you have to know who is in front of you. So if you're going to photograph, you're going to do a video, you have to, to know who is this person. And you have to be open for them to surprise you. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, Becker wouldn't be here tonight. <laughs> Imagine if I was stuck with my idea of two Iraqis, two Iraqis, you wouldn't be in the book, you know. And also because he's finished very well. <laughs> he prepared himself. And yourself, Becker. To cover a difficult story, to do what you do in your work, how do you? Well, I, I think it's, first of all, um, if, if the story is worth, worth it, um, depends on my focus. Like, my focus used to be mainly about either militant groups or hard, hard news. Uh, I used to do a lot of research about the topic, read about it, interview people before even I go to that uh, assignment. In order, to, in order to understand it more, and then I, I go for it. But in conflicts in general, we plan for how to exit before we start getting into a lot of details. If a plan, we uh, um, like we do it now with a team that we have in different uh, areas in Asia. If there is a demonstration, th protests, we need to make sure that the journalist who is going to cover it can leave before actually we, we think about uh, sending them there. So there is a proper, um, I would call it SOPs or steps that we, we go through whenever we send people to cover violence, riots, unrest, and then it goes to from kind of um, conflict zones into, uh, zones into a war zone. The war zone also arrangements are, are completely different than the conflict or the unrest zones. Uh, we classify even the um, natural disasters zones as conflict or, or high risk zones. When there is a volcano, when there is an earthquake, when there are floods, again, you cannot send a, a reporter uh, to, a, to an area with floods and uh, that reporter cannot come back. So all of these things would usually we take it in, 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 in consideration. And I guess this is, this is one of the courses that is taught to journalists, how to cover conflicts, unrest, and also uh, war zones. I think that we're going to take one last question because we're running up out of time and uh, there was somebody there with a hand raised. Hi. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all. Well, it was a pleasure to listen to you, talking, sharing. Uh, my question is more about um, some small instance of choices, like small words that you use, like the political frame of choices, because it took my attention that Becker said that he didn't use the word terrorist in his book. He used the word militant, and he, he, he said it was a political choices because um, it's obvious, but sometimes uh, the words used, they had the political load behind it. So I thought about, uh, do you think it's a role of the journalism to make these choices and to stand for it? Because sometimes it, it takes the, the, the cost to legitimate these choices um, in the public opinion broadly. So I'd like to listen to you all about these choices and how to, to do it in the best way and how to stand it for it. Why are you always the, the, the difficult ones to me? No, I didn't speak now. Oh, ah, the choices. I mean, for example, the word fundamentalist. The word fundamentalist means that you, are f you go to the fundaments of that religion. And uh, the fundamentals of any religion is not bad. You know, you don't, you don't preach hate and killing and all that. So even the word fundamentalist that people use, journalists use all over the place, if you think about it, it's a strange choice. We never think about it because we are eating all this as they are normal. So I remember in the book I have this, I don't know if there is any fundamentalist there, I don't think so, because I was very aware of this. And sometimes it's just, you know, 
You don't need to know everything, but you need to know where to look for the answers. That's a very important thing, you know. Nobody knows everything, you know. And mainly nowadays that you have to know, so you have to cover so many subjects. And many international affairs that you have so many things happening. You don't know anything, but you have to know. So I always try to have good sources, uh, which is not necessarily only Google or only, on, or, but people that I can call uh, and to talk about. And I thought, this makes sense or this doesn't make sense. Um, and I, for example, there is one thing uh, uh, in Portugal. I did, uh, we talk about, uh, well, let's say, um brasileiro, a Brazilian killed a woman in Lisbon. Why you have to use the nationality of this person? That's another choice. So when you use that, oh, uh, a Pakistani killed someone in Vienna, why you use the nationality? It's important for the news? It's because he's a Pakistani that he kills a woman? Or anybody can kill a woman, you know, it kills a woman. So we have to start to think about when, when you use on headlines, because if it's a Portuguese, you're in Portugal. If it's a Portuguese who kills a woman, you're going to say a Portuguese kills a woman? No, you're not going to say that. So we, we have to start thinking about what we write, and because we want, to be, uh, we want to catch the attention of the reader. But in trying to do these kind of things, we are just, you know, reproduce prejudice yeah. and, mm -hmm. and hate and wrong perceptions. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of choice, you know, I think you have to be aware of the language you're using and the words you're choosing. As a journalist, mm -hmm. you have to use the words in the, the best right way, way yeah. to write the best right or to transmit the more accurate news, mm -hmm. piece of news. Yeah. I answer it. Passing to Bakker, just uh, want to add just a very quick example that we see every day in Brazilian journalism. And we're talking about drug trafficking. Usually, if it's a black person caught with uh, some illegal drugs, usually yeah. cocaine or uh, marijuana, you would say a trafficker. You would read in the press, there's a trafficker, going, uh, a drug dealer doing this and that. If it's a white young person, you'd say, uh, a uh, student from the university here and there is caught mm -hmm. selling uh, There is a very good example. Drugs. You know, you remember the, when in New Zealand there was a white man yes. Yeah, yes. who killed lots of Muslims in a mosque, okay? Yeah. They said this guy is insane. They never said it was it's a, a white radical terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. If it's a Muslim it who commits it, it's a radical fundamentalist Muslim. So it's different. So yeah. the guy is white, it's totally different. So this is something yeah. that you guys, you're the new generation, you have to change yeah. this. Not, I mean, I'm too old for that. <laughs> no, and you, you have to bear old. this in mind, and not only that, <laughs> you have to be able to explain to your boss, to your editor, to somebody else, why you, you choose this, choice. this yeah. or that word, yeah. and then be able to have the argument to yeah. work. <laughs> Oh, he's Just very one. lazy. Oh, no, you're so one, lazy no, no, today. One <laughs> <laughs> because he's working hard every day. No, so I, now I, is the last I one. I think uh, you picked up you picked uh, this up all from the word terrorist, correct? Yeah. S simply because if if you go back and and try to understand what terrorism is, it is actually an act. It's not uh, uh, you know an adjective that you give it to people. This is what I really believe in, and the the, the way it has been used throughout, especially the past twenty years. It was politically used. If I don't like you, you are a terrorist. If I like you, you are a, a freedom fighter, for example. So any, any group that use violence, use uh, arms against uh, a system, a government, a state, those are militants, non-state, or what we call them in politics, non-state actors. Do, uh, they, they are militants. Um, if they are within the country itself, the, you might, m m uh, you might, we might call them insur uh, insurgents or insurgency. Um, and there are several in insurgency movements in, in different, either even here in 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 in, uh, in, in South America. So I think uh, uh, using the right term, the right description for something is very important. But do we? Uh, do we judge, we are not supposed to judge as journalists. 
we are supposed to inform and we are not supposed to impose on, on people. But we need, we, again, we shouldn't be uh, just following what we hear. We need to think. That's why I, I, I had this little advice uh, to all of my journalist colleagues. Listen more than you talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't repeat. Think about mm -hmm. what you say. Yeah. Um, the last uh, advice I would add in the, on the same line, we, are, we need always a balanced story. But remember, a balanced story doesn't mean people would be happy from you. Mm -hmm. Balanced story means you need to put facts at it, as it is. And uh, with this humble experience in journalism, if people are not happy, not people, mainly if governments are not happy with your reporting, that means you are doing right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would add something here. You know who is Christiana Mampour? She's very famous, CNN. And there is a quote, I, I remember this during the Bosnia War in the 90s, th there was a big massacre uh, done by, by the Serbs. Srebrenica. Uh, yeah, I think it was Srebrenica, that, that one. And there was like, all the bodies and everything. And someone was telling her, you have to hear the Serbian side of the story. And she <laughs> said, okay, I'm going to Slobodan Milosevic, yes. or I'm going to Hadzan Karadzic, they're going to tell me that they didn't do it. But I'm seeing it, and everybody saw it. That's so uh, this is balanced story because, again, it's the spokesperson. Mm -hmm. It's the journalism of the spokespeople. Uh, so no, I'm seeing here, I'm, <laughs> you know, I don't need to, to, and because he, he would say that he hadn't done it. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And just as my closing line as well, taking, taking from this point of terrorism militant, you have this example, Osama bin Laden, when he was fighting the Soviets with American weapons, he was a freedom fighter yeah. when he was a Mujahideen. And then he became a terrorist as soon as he Overnight. started Overnight. attacking uh, American or Western uh, targets. Anyway. I think we're going to close here. They'll be signing books outside. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention to be here with us. And of course, I'd like to leave Simone and uh, to let also Bakke to say their last words for you <laughs> right now. Thomas. And thank you very much. Yes. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Amar and his team, and Julia, and everybody at, at uh, FGV. And I hope uh, it helps in any way. And I wish you all the luck in the profession and for the ones who are not journalists. I wish all the luck, <laughs> no matter what. And have more empathy uh, regarding, uh, you never know what the person next to you is going through and be more gentle with them. Well, I just want to thank you all for uh, your patience and uh, listening to this all and I hope I have added uh, to, I mean, what you know already. Um, I don't want really to talk much. So just I wanted to thank you and uh, yeah, you all keep up the good work that you are doing. Seminar, fake news.